Yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out. And yeah, I know so. we're all tired of COVID and fatigued <laughs> by it, but I think it was such a seminal moment for all of us. It really mm-hmm. changed a lot for all of us. How did you survive the COVID time period and how did it affect the way that you do things now? Um, you know what? I, I had a, a completely different experience during COVID. Um, I was actually going through coaching finishing up my coaching certification. So I was a part of a coaching support group and had this really, um, really high touch, high level group of women that I was affiliated with. Mm -hmm. And um, because I had already been working from home, um, other than my kids being at home more, my life really didn't change. Texas was really open. Um, you know, more so Fort Worth than Dallas. Cause I live in the middle of the Metroplex, but it was, it was really a time where I leaned into podcasting. So instead of seeing people in person a whole lot, um, I leaned into podcasting. So that's when I started my podcast, launched my coaching business full time because my plan a gig did, um, get eliminated So I was working with the cancer society, coaching cancer patients and working with them on community events. And so that position went away. My coaching was going to be a five-year plan and that got escalated to a a two-month plan. And um, I really just, I don't know, it, to me, it was a different surreal experience where I got to lean in more and I didn't, I didn't experience the fatigue. And I think also that goes to prove whatever you focus on, whatever you look for is what you find. Yeah. I wasn't looking for the, the big hard problems and the big walls. Um, I'm fortunate to be in Texas, so I didn't experience it forced on me, but otherwise it was really, our life didn't change much. Okay. We got to pick up, we got to pick up margaritas in the drive-thru and bring them home. That was different or have it delivered to our house. So, Hey, that was cool. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, I think there was a lot of people out there that did have a lot of things that there wasn't a seismic sure. shift. There, there there, was actually good things that took place during that mm-hmm. time period, not to take away from the woe of what was happening. But um, yeah, no, we don't want to diminish that. But also, I, I agree. I mean, I think it just it was a shift. Yeah, it certainly was. So let's get into the heart and soul of what you do with all the things that you juggle and do yeah. with your life. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders. It's career day. And one of the kids is like, Hey, what do you do for a living? What's your answer? I love that perspective that you, you kind of set set me up for third graders. So I get to help women, especially, but not exclusively. I get to help women see themselves as valuable so they can live the life that, and do their jobs the way that they were meant to be without being so hard on themselves and alienating themselves from those that really need them. So what did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream? I wanted, well, two things. Um, I wanted to be a waitress. I wanted to own a restaurant because my grandparents owned restaurants. And every time I would go to their house. And so I grew up in New Mexico and they were in Texas. And every time I would go to their house, they had all of these old, um, where you could take somebody's order, these little pads. And I always played waitress. So I wanted to be a waitress and I wanted to be a nurse. Wow. Wow. I remember that show growing up, Alice, and she was the, she was at a cafe. It was a cafe kind of centered thing, and I, I, I don't I don't remember that one, but it, yeah, I I loved it. Yeah, that's cool. So, talk to me a little bit about be, mm-hmm. beyond the dream of being a waitress and all of that, being in a restaurant scenario. Yeah. What were some of the seeds that were planted into you early on to take on a leadership role, to help women get to a better place mm-hmm. and to also for yourself evolve and be an example to your clients? Yeah. I think at the core, what I learned is that I really have a servant's heart. And so waiting on people, waitressing, bringing them food, um, that was really a desire to help nourish and, and, serve people. And then also the desire to be a nurse, that's really about caretaking. And I get to do that as a coach, I get to do it in a different way. But it's the same perspective that I really want to help people's hearts and mind heal. I want their soul to be filled, I want their life to be filled. 
And getting to do that as a coach, I feel like is the most rewarding job. It's like all of the things above that um, I wanted to do. What was the moment? What was the client? What was the sparkle in someone's eye where you were like, yeah. this is my calling. This is, I need to be coaching. I need to be helping. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll tell you, it all started with me um, coaching my daughter. She was in pageant competing for a pageant and her coach had been killed in a car accident who was a friend of ours that had been coaching her for free. And at the time I was a single mom and I had to step in and coach her. And when I say coach, it was write her speeches, help her deliver speeches, learn how to memorize them, learn how to interview and step into a level of confidence that she didn't already possess. And so when I started doing that and then saw that those skills are the same skills I was using for my, my financial clients. Um, and I began to duplicate my conversations on both sides. And I saw lights going off for both of them, that these were internal things that they could control. Um, I was hooked, but the biggest thing was when my daughter won her first speech competition. And when she came to me and she was like, I can do this mom. Like, like they said, I'm good. So that validates. It. I too was so proud. Number one, that she won. And, and secondly, I was like, oh my God, she just put all of her power into other people's opinions. And I'm like, we're going to change that. Like that was like the opposite for me. I wanted her to have the internal power and yep. for her to feel great, regardless of what anybody else thought. And, um, she ended up winning the, the highest level in Texas that you can win for Rodeo Queens is Miss Rodeo, Texas. And she won that in 2013 and she did it her way. And she did it with such confidence and grace, internal grace, um, that that's really when I saw like this all is such a culmination of an internal journey with external um, proof and external benefits. And, um, I went on that journey kind of a couple of steps ahead of her doing my own healing so I could help her heal and her step into this place and not have the same wounds that I had and get to see them, you know, lived out and manifested in my clients and financial clients. And in 2017, I walked away from my financial advisory practice and went to the cancer society, 2020, walked away from that. And, um, I've been coaching full-time ever since just watching the lights go off in people's eyes. So who's been a hero for you? Who's been that inspiration for you in your life? Um, my daughter for one. Um, but then I had a coach that was from New Zealand who had, her name is Sally Anderson. And she was someone that I pursued um, because she had this crazy story of trauma and even with that story of trauma, um, and it's probably too much to go into right now, but that story, she still is the kindest, most loving, giving, generous person. And I'm like, if you can do the, all that, still have confidence, still feel loving towards humanity, there's nothing I could go through that could make, get, that could give me an excuse to not be that way. Yeah. Yeah. And when I saw that, it allowed me to, it allowed me to have this love for humanity and, and a greater purpose for inspiring that same confidence in others. So whether it's in your field or just in general, mm -hmm. you can meet one person alive on the planet that you find yeah. fascinating, interesting, spend some time with them, see how they operate. Who would that mm -hmm. be? <laughs> um. Honestly, I would say that I would love if I had to pick one, it would probably be Trump, but I would love to spend time with both candidates yeah, and really see why, like what is going on in our political world right now? Um, there has to be more than what the public is being made aware of. Um, I would love to make sense of the chaos yeah. and understand the humans behind the machines that are running them right now. Yeah, well said. So at the end of the day, 
what's the best advice you've ever gotten? I mean, you're helping people, mm. you're giving, you're giving of yourself to people. What's the best advice you've ever gotten? <laughs> it's really simple. Other people's opinions of you are none of your business. There you go. Yeah. Be because I can't control what other people think. And as someone who grew up um, very wounded from my adoption story and what I made it mean about me, I was such a people pleaser and it's exhausting. It's exasperating. It's defeating. And once I realized that I can't control how other people see me, how they feel about me, um, I could only control and I'm only aware of my own intentions and actions. And when I stop giving that so much power, so much credit and stop considering that in every decision I make, it's so freeing and it just allows me to, to love them anyway and love myself anyway. So what is the motivation for you every day to wake up to do this work that you do? You, you're giving a lot of yourself, mm -hmm. but you also have to hold enough back for yourself and your daughter and what you're doing with your life. What is that collective gumption for you every day to be who you are and to help people? Yeah. Um, because I've done so much internal work, the true, true, true driving force every day when I get up is when I die, I want to leave a legacy where I'm remembered as someone who made the people around me, the space around me, the world around me, a better place because I was here. So every day, um, I believe in God. Um, and every day I get up and I'm like, okay, all right, God, what are we doing today? He's my CEO. He's the one that I really defer to that opens doors. And so I just want to make a difference. And when I go, whatever that day transition is, I want people to feel like because they knew me, their life was better. So Speaking of youth, you were talking about your daughter. Let's say you have a dream tonight. Yeah. You run into an 18-year-old version of you. You can mm -hmm. give that young version of you a piece of advice based on this life you've lived, the wisdom you've gained along the way. Yeah. What advice would you impart and would that young version of you listen? Um, she probably wouldn't. <laughs> she was very, very much the person that had to experience it. And I still experience a lot of things um, or I learn by experiencing and if I could share anything, I would probably want her to know that she is perfect exactly the way she is. Everything she's going through, there's a purpose. There's a purpose for her pain. And I would want everyone, every, every one of my clients, I want them to know whatever you've gone through, it's for you. It is crafting you and molding you and making you exactly who you're supposed to be. Don't begrudge those lessons. Don't mourn them. Don't grieve them. Um, I would love for her to miss a few of them, but I love who I am today. And I'm who I am today because of the things I've gone through and the choices I've made good and bad. Um, so I would just say, be kinder to yourself, love yourself a little more, have more grace for yourself. Don't be so hard and so critical. Um, and know that everything you're going through, there's a reason. So as a podcaster, what was the first podcast mm -hmm. that really hooked you in? You were like, I kind of like this world. I want to, I want to get into it more. Um, oh gosh, back in 2020, what was I listening to? Um, I honestly, I'm trying to think, um, probably Ed Milet was a big one. Okay. Um, Maybe it was Jay Shetty back then. I don't remember. Um, but the whole reason I started a podcast was because my um, my best friend and sister, soul sister, uh, was doing a podcast. We were going to coaching school together. And I told her that I really wanted to provide, through my coaching, a space for women to have a voice. And she said, yeah. you need to have a podcast. And I'm like, I don't even know what that would look like. I don't have the equipment. I don't know how to do that. Um, and she said, just get started, just get started. And so I wanted to create a space where women championed each other. And I was doing some speaking at the time. And one of the things I talked about was moving our rocks. And so I consider rocks or I call them rocks. Those are the things that, you know, we say that person's got a lot of baggage. 
Yeah. Well, that baggage is full of rocks, right? It's the challenges, the obstacles, the traumas, the things that we've picked up along the way that are super heavy. And we continue to just pile it on and carry it through our adult life. Usually those things start getting in our bags when we're little. And one day I realized I don't have to carry this heavy bag anymore inside this bag with all of these rocks are also lessons attached to them. What if I remove the heaviness and just carried the lesson? And so I was talking about that in this presentation one day to Texas businesswomen. And I'm like, we can move these rocks out and lay the rock down and put the beautiful lesson back in the bag. And now this bag is beautiful. And it's not this ugly trash bag full of all this heavy stuff. It's this beautiful Louis Vuitton that we get to carry with all these lessons. And so we get to become movers of rocks or rock movers. And my friend that was watching my speech, um, she was like, hashtag rock movers. That's like your new thing. And I was like, there's my podcast, Rock Movers. Like we're going to be rock movers. We're going to move these challenges out of our bags, lay them down. This is the path that we're building for those coming behind us. Yeah. And I just get to carry these lessons and share those lessons. And so um, started my podcast the next day and called it Rock Movers. Excellent. So speaking of this journey you've been on in your life, of everything that yeah. you've done, accomplished, and evolved into, what are you ultimately the proudest of? Wow. Um, I, it's, I don't know if it's cheesy, but I really am proudest of my kids. Yeah. Um, with my adoption story, uh, I have kids that have a big age gap. So I was married super young, got pregnant in high school, um, had my son, kept him, married him. So I have a son and a daughter that are older. And then I have two boys that are younger from another marriage. And just to see as an adoptee, you want to see your face in someone when you don't have that, that connection, that lineage. Um, I've since found my adopted family, my biological family. Um, I have a great relationship with both sides, but to see my kids loving and nurturing and being like, we're a tight family and this is my DNA and my DNA gets to go on. And the, the brokenness that I brought into this world and that I carried um, stopped with me. Yeah. And so they get to go forward. They're going to make their own mistakes. They're going to have their own things to heal through, but these traumas stopped and they get to go forward healed with a, a new sense of confidence and a new outlook on life, knowing what their lineage is. There's no, there's no questions. Yeah. And I'm so super it, proud of that. Yeah, for sure. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, all of your listeners to your show, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Um, I love this because I'm doing some marketing and branding right now. So I've been diving into these thoughts and um, actually as many people as you know, there's that many versions of you out there. Yeah. So, you know, thousands and millions. Um, but for me, who I know myself to be is a woman of integrity, a woman of character, a woman of deep compassion and empathy and love. And um, I am a strong advocate for those I care about. I will defend them to the line. Um, and I love really, really big. And so whether that's my immediate family, my spouse, especially, um, or those that I call sisters, which are women that I meet. Like if I meet you, you're my sister. And if you're in my inner circle, like you're my soul sister. Yeah. And so, um, I have really deep ties to people that I meet. And I feel like that just elevates us all. We all win together. And I'm really proud that my circle doesn't all look like me. What's the most revelatory thing that you've learned about having your own podcast? I know doing mm. this for me personally, it's like, yeah. I think we're all much more alike. I think there's a version of modern therapy that goes into this. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of extraordinary people out there doing things every day that mm -hmm. aren't profiled in what we would call the media. 
Yeah. But for you, what's been the most revelatory part of this process, which obviously, as you know, takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. <laughs> a lot of time. <laughs> what is it for you? <laughs> Man. Um, so, so there's a personal revelation that I've had, and then there's a professional one. Um, personally, I grew up hating my boys. I thought it was super young, super immature, um, very adolescent. And I don't know if it's changed over the years, probably has, but I get so many comments about my voice that I now love my voice. I love it. So that has been, and I only discovered that through podcasting. Yeah. So that I'm grateful for. Um, the other revelation that I've had professionally is um, it's really easy to make um, judgments based on, you know, people when we look at someone who we think they are mm -hmm. and the assumptions that we make about their stories. And I have been so pleasantly surprised by some of my guests. Um, and they come on and they have such sto stories of resilience. There's something inspiring in each of them. And sometimes they surprise themselves when they're asked the right questions. Yeah. And so, so I love that part of podcasting. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. So what's the best part of living in Dallas? Oh, gosh. Um, for me, I am, I really love the fact that I live in the suburb of Dallas, so not in Dallas proper. And I love that I can be anywhere and experience pretty much any culture um, within our Metroplex boundaries. Yeah. And um, the media would have us believe that there is such bias and racism and I don't see it. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't personally experience it. Yeah. Um, I did experience it in the deep South when I lived in Florida, South Tallahassee, Florida, um, going to FSU. Um, I experienced reverse racism, reverse discrimination. So I do know it exists. Um, but I also know now how to manage those conversations better. Yeah. And in Dallas, um, all of my circles ha are very mixed. They're very diverse. And you can go have Indian food or Thai food or whatever. I'm a big foodie. You can have any food. And in those conversations or in those places, um, I pursue conversations. I ask questions and learn. I want to learn about that culture. I want to learn about that experience. And um, it's just fun in Dallas. People are open because of the uh, the commerce that's coming here. And I mean, we just have such an influx of people coming from all over. Um, it's just really, really diverse. Yeah. So let me ask you this. We get off the call. Time machine mm -hmm. pulls up to your house. You can go yep. anywhere in the history of time and see one moment, one event with oh, your own wow. eyes. What would you love to have seen? And it won't affect, it won't put a ripple in time. It won't be weird. You just get to witness it. Gosh, there's so many. <laughs> um, How do you pick one, Joe? It, it's this hard. Is... You could hop around a little bit if you need to. Should have okay. So I would love to witness my own birth. Yeah. Um, because I was adopted, I would love to know what my mom really experienced in that moment. Yeah. Um, because I know her story, I would love to see what really happened, and and also I would love to just somehow pour love on her so that she didn't carry the guilt forward. Yeah. Um, another time I, my father, my birth father, um, was killed in a car accident before I discovered who he was. I would love to go back and see him Yeah. to see, you know, how he moved and what he looked like. And I have a brother from him, um, who his mother was pregnant when our father died. So he never got to see him either. Um, so I would just love to know who he was, yeah. um, I would love to go back in time into the suffrage movement when women were in the streets um, campaigning and fighting for equal rights. Um, 
there is a part of me that would just love that. Like I, I love to fight for, um, the underdog and to, for things that are, you know, such a disparity. I love to fight for that. Um, I would love to go back and meet, um, I got to meet, um, uh, Reagan. I would love to go back and meet, um, JFK and Roosevelt and Kennedy. Like I would just, I I mean, I would just love, 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 love to go meet all of these. I love politics and um, would love to go back and meet them. Um, That's a great list. I don't know. There's just so much. Yeah, there is. There's an enormous amount, but that's a great list. I always love it when it turns into personal because that would be cool. (laughs) I mean, that's, that's the way to do it. So if anyone wants to tune into Moving Rocks or they want to hire you, they want to reach out, yeah. any of the good business, how can they do that? Um, you can find me pretty much anywhere, Coach Karen Gray. So I'm on the, all the social sites, Coach Karen Gray, G-R-A-Y. My website's CoachKarenGray.com. And um, I've got a mastermind. I am doing really high profile coaching for those I realize based on my own experience, the higher you go, the more isolated and alone it can feel. So women in high level positions often struggle the most with imposter syndrome and isolation and just feeling like an island. Um, So I would really love to reach those women and and support them. Um, Yeah, Coach Karen Gray everywhere. And then my podcast is called Rock Movers. So you can listen to my voice, you can hear my guests, you can tune into all the amazing people who are moving rocks in the world. That's wonderful. Karen, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your story. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for what you're doing. Spreading good news. Yes, absolutely. Best of luck with everything. Thank you. You too.